get someone next to you uh, and tell them you don't need but one plan. You don't need but one plan. Uh, repeat these words after me. Many are the plans. Many are the plans. In a person's heart. In a person's heart. But it is the Lord's purpose. It is the Lord's purpose. That prevails. That prevails. Still prevails. 
I want you to see, based on the same text, that God has a plan. Our God has a plan. I really want you to get this inside your spirit. God has a plan. And he's not asking your permission for his plan. And his plan is his plan above all other plans. And no matter what's on your mind, on your heart, on what you think is most important, and sometimes it amazes me when people get upset at God because God ain't working on your plan. Amen. But God, he has, he has a plan. And what a simple and most profound text. God is up to something. He's always got something he's doing. He's always got a plan. And the plan's trying to achieve an agenda, an objective that you may not be aware of. Where nothing happens he has not already anticipated. Nothing takes place that God did not know was going to happen. That does not mean he made it happen. It means he already knew what was going to happen. And he put together a purpose. Already anticipating what bad decisions somebody else is going to make. So I want you to be aware that he has got a plan so you can relax. And you can trust God because he knows what he's doing. Now, let me make sure I clarify that. Because sometimes we give both the impression with saying that everything is fated to happen. Uh, I, I never forget uh, one of my friends I was raised with. Uh, well, I wasn't raised in my early raggedy years. We got together. Let's say like that. And so, and so Otis was my friend. We got together. But see, one day, one day Otis had had a conflict with his, his sister's uh, husband, his sister's husband, had, had, had been beating up on her, he confronted them, and there was a tension between them, uh, and, and the sister's boyfriend or husband had, had chased him with a bat one day, and so, so Otis shows up to visit at his mother's house, and who inside the house exists except his sister's husband? And Otis tells him, uh, uh, you better not come outside this house. And Otis goes outside the house, and the guy makes a statement. What's it going to be? What's going to be? And the guy walks out into the driveway and orders an attempt to scare him and make him run like he made him run, call himself shooting in the air to make him run. But he ain't too low. Shot him in the head. The man that said, what's going to be? See, sometimes we think he's a patient to happen. And we make statements like that. Let me know what else is going to happen. God's already planned it. God has not planned out your bad choices. He's put a plan together understanding you're going to make some bad choices. But it's not that he has decided in advance time that you're going to make a bad decision. Well, you know, it ain't my fault I, I, I robbed the bank. I mean, God had planned. You know, he didn't plan to rob no bank. You make decisions that you want to make. So I don't believe the idea to say God has a plan and a purpose for things. It does not mean that God made you make a bad decision. You have the greatest power that you can find in life. That's the power to choose. But at the same time, you can trust that God knows what he's doing. So the text says this. Look at this. Many plans, many are the plans in a person's heart. There are many plans inside the mind of people. Many are your plans, but God has only one. It's important to say, God, he is not like us. We have a mirage. I share with you the word, the idea of the text. We have a long list of things we try to do. If you don't understand God, you can't even understand your life. If you can't understand the one who made life, you can't understand what life is all about. If I don't know what an iPad is, and I come across for the first time, I have no understanding of what it is. What it, is. It, it looks like a it looks like a mirror. It's a bad mirror. I can barely see. It's so dark inside this mirror. Hey, it's not making any sense. If I don't understand what its purpose is, if I don't understand why it was made, then there's no way I can possibly infuse the value it's supposed to have inside of it. I've got to understand what was the original intention of the ones that put the product together. That's why even when they sell you a 
toothbrush before the instruction on how to use the toothbrush. That's why every time they get on a plane, they don't trust you to know how to put on the seatbelt. Now, I've been doing seatbelt since 1949. We don't care how long you see the seatbelt. If you get on our plane, we don't trust you. We're going to tell you, here's the seatbelt, here's its purpose, here's how you use it, because it's important that you understand the reason it's on the plane. So it's key to understand that unless you understand God, you can't understand the world you live in. You can't understand the purpose of what you're trying to achieve. You're blind and you're lost and you don't know you're lost because you don't even know what you're here for in the first place. I spent some time counseling with a mother and a son on yesterday in the and a you know, great kid, he's 14 years old, making some bad decisions. And, and as I'm talking to him, I'm aware, I'm trying to get you to see some things that at 14 you can't see. Because you don't understand how rebellion against your mom, good instruction, will affect your future. All you see right now is I want to do this. And you can't comprehend, as simplistic as your choices are, how the simplest decision in the world that don't seem like much can destroy your future. Yeah. Anybody saw the news this week? Yeah. Girl inside of Walmart in Lufkin, Texas, not far. Had to be somebody near my own time. <laughs> Open the door, pull out a, a, some bluebell ice cream, and I'll be, it's a Texas ice cream. They don't come no better than that. Take the top off and lick it and put the top back on. Stick it back in the, in the, in the fridge in the wall. Now they're looking for her. Say so she can get 20 years. You can get 20 years for licking an ice cream put it back. She did not comprehend the totality of the consequences of a dumb choice. All of establishment is the reality that you really got to be careful. When you don't see the bigger picture, the simplest of decisions can rock your world and ruin your life. And so I want you to comprehend, therefore, there are many plans, but we can't, we can't see the future. I, I, can't, I can't tell you what's going to happen in five minutes. I can't tell you why you're going through what you're going through. But I can tell you the one who's in control has one plan. Yes. Our problems, we got too many. Well, consider, consider these thoughts in conjunction with this idea of one thing. You may feel lost and alone, but God knows precisely where you are. And he has a good plan for your future. This isn't something you need to be wondering about. This is something you ought to know. There is a future for me because no matter where I am and what I'm going through, the God who made me did not let me be here without a plan for me. If I understand that and I believe that, I can't live my life blindly floating around like ain't nothing going on up in here. There's a plan and there's something taking place for the child of God. I know God has a plan. I pray for direction to follow it. Patience, you know, to wait on it, and now it's not when it comes. I got a Lord, I know there's a plan, I know you're doing something. Help me to learn how to wait on my turn. Any of y'all ever get in a jump rope before? Kids working in, swinging rope, you know, you're on the side line with them. You gotta get your rhythm going so you jump in there. Life is like that. You gotta know how to have the rhythm to see when do I move? But when do I sit still? Sometimes you're trying to move too fast. So understand the child of God has had the wisdom to realize that God's got a plan. He's working on something I've got to trust him. God has a reason for allowing things to happen. We may never understand his wisdom, but we simply have to trust his will. I don't get it. Maybe you ain't close to get it yet. Maybe, maybe. It's not about you. See, it's so key to realize, I believe, 
that most things that God allows in your life are not about you. Right. But I think not about is sometimes I'm able to look at someone who allowed me to touch and I can somehow see how hell I went through pain. I had to face turmoil that shook my life up. Times that I had to cry and I can look and say, oh look, thank you because now I can see how that blessed, blessed me to give to something to somebody who couldn't have handled it without knowing what I've been through. Maybe it ain't about you having a good, soft, nice, quiet life. Woo. God got a plan that's bigger than you. So I want you to realize in light of this idea, the dilemma is that in this word, the word inside this text, the word inside this text that many of man's plans, the word plans here actually is defined six different ways. There are six ways this Hebrew word for plans is used in the Old Testament. Six different ways. Identifying this our dilemma is that God has won. We get divided between six different ideas. And you wonder why I'm confused. Six. So let, let's give you ideas. That first way the word is used for the word for planning. It's the same word used when Joseph's brothers got together. They said, this, this boy, he, he talked about he had a dream and he will be old Russ and what we going to do. Tell the daddy to send him to meet up with us. And when he get here, what we're going to do, we're going to take him and we're going to kill him. And we're going to put him in a pit, and put him in a pit, rather, and then we're going to kill him. And after we kill him, we're going to tell daddy he's dead. That was their plan. That was their plan. The word has the idea of, of, of putting together a plan that can be for good or for evil. And the Bible says when they, when they came, the oldest brother in Sarubin said, no, no, let's not kill him. That's too much. Let's just sell him into slavery. We can get rid of him, and we ain't got to be accountable for his death. That was their plan. And the Bible says later in the Genesis that, that he says to when, when Joseph finally revealed himself to his brothers, he tells his brothers, you planned it for evil. But then he says, but God planned it for good. Same word. God puts together a plan, and God's plan will outshine anybody else's plan. Thank God that God can plan based on somebody else's evil. I got a plan to take you up. And God said, yeah, I know that. Work your plan. Watch me take your plan and bless them with a plan that you plan for evil. That's why I don't get upset at folk who try to do something wrong. All right. Your worst plan against me is a setup for God to show how powerful he is. I ain't got to be mad at you. All right. <laughs> People plan good, God has a plan too. So one, the word here, plan, is defined as planning. But secondly, the word here, plan, is defined as judgment. Isaiah talks about how, in Isaiah, uh, uh, he talks about, about Jesus coming. He discusses the idea that he was stricken for our transgression. His point of idea, we assume, we assume he was nothing. The word plan identifies that sometimes we make assumptions with my mind. My mind assumes certain things. I recall, I recall quite a conversation with my mom back when he was saying, uh, did you tell me the rumor about, about this person? And, and you did. What did you think about that rumor? I said, I, I assumed there was a rumor. So I didn't think about it. I didn't draw a conclusion about a rumor. If I got a legitimate question about you, I'm going to ask you myself. But the point is, I did many times we draw assumptions about things without matters. You know, I assume you may not to speak to me, I assume you saw me standing here. I assume that you don't treat me that way on purpose. I assume you don't like me. I we make assumptions inside of our mind. The word has the idea of how we assume some things about others and things about the life that we live in. So, so, so our minds are divided because sometimes we're playing with our minds and sometimes we're making assumptions with our minds. Thirdly, third, the word is used also the idea of a running thought, a thought through the mind. We meditate. It's the word for the idea to focus. We, we can, with our minds, we can actually meditate. Meditation can be good or bad. I've got advice to the God. Uh, yoga is often talk about the idea of, of, of meditation, but, but there is a sense, there's a peace that comes with knowing how to meditate. Yes. Uh, 
to the mayor about 40 years right when I first got married. Every now and then you have a, a conflict in, in, in you know, I, 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 what I would do, I, I would not go meditate when I got angry. I go on and I would, what I would actually do, I would go in a, and I'd go in a room, I mean, this is a large time, I'd go in a room and I'd go in a closet, turn the lights off and sit in a lotus position and just focus and meditate. she come in later on. <laughs> so, you okay? So, yeah, yeah, I, I, need, I need to get everything else out. Mm -hmm. I need I need to get a grip on my head. The point is the idea that, that we have the same mind we can meditate, but meditation can also become fixation. When you put your mind fixed on something to the point you just can't shake it out your mind. You can't I just you know this that's what worry is about. Worry is the inability to let something go. I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I just, you know, I can't, I just, I keep thinking about this stuff, I just, I can't just sit on my mind all the time, I just, when I'm fixated with it, I just, I can't seem, I can't seem to shape the idea, I can't seem to shape the thought, I can't seem to shape the memory, we get fixated, and so the mind, the word has the same idea, the plan, the, the Bible uses the term plan to suggest the idea that sometimes your mind gets stuck on something, and you can't seem to move it. It grips your brain. Our minds are divided. Then he uses another term, it imputes. It imputes. The Bible says that God imputed, he imputed uh, 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 Abraham's actions as righteousness to impute as the idea of talk. He held, God did not hold it against him. But the idea of imputing has the core idea of to be stuck on something. Some of us, our minds won't let you forgive. Your mind won't let you let stuff go. Every time I see you. Mm -hmm. Oh, he ain't gonna come back. Every time I come up, I, don't, don't say their name. Mm. I don't want to hear about them. I don't want to see them. Because there's something. I am stuck. I am stuck. I can't let it go. I can't forgive. I'm holding it. It's got a grip on me. And, and be aware. Things that have a grip on you are controlling you. Amen. So the word plan has the idea of of putting together a plan to achieve something. It has the idea of making assumptions or judgments. It has the idea of, of getting meditated on something that you can't let go. It has the idea of being unable to forgive or to release or let go of something that's happened inside the world that you're living. Number five, it has the idea to invent. The word is also used when one, one occasion in scripture or testament when, they, when the men are, are they plan, the plan was to, to build buildings, the plan was to, to, to create in, 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 inventive ways of, of irrigation, inventing has the idea to invent. I'm amazed always with the core idea of the brilliance of God. God spoke and we got dirt, grass, Water, animals, trees, air. And then God gives man this brilliance that he has. And man makes things out of dirt. All this is is sand, a little tree, a little uh, sand, this tree, it's a little rock. It's a combination of, of, of elements God made. It. And God gives man the brilliant capacity to invent like he did. So the word has this idea, the idea of the mind's creativity. So man plan a best mind becomes creative. And then the last word, Thomas word, the word is for the idea of accounting. It's a word for how men sit down and give an account, financial account of business taking place, a bookkeeping account. That's the idea of the word also. But it has the idea of man's capacity. We have a tendency to keep records. We call it the junkie to the house. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is 
This is an old picture from 1949 in the family. And this is this is my first uh, my kindergarten year. I drew this picture. They saved that, and um, I'm on I'm 49 right now. But it's not, it's not, I, I do this at, I do this at five years old. It's about, it's about record. <laughs> The point is the idea that, that the word is used for the idea of man's capacity to keep records, his capacity to hold things together. We attempt to figure out things, and, and what, what a record keeping Record keeping is a way of figuring out things value. So I use my mind to try to figure out the value of things. Man's plans are many. Our plans are many. There are plans. These are plans. Our minds are divided, and most of the time, most of the time, you don't even realize how divided your mind is between trying to create and figure out and calculate and understand and play. All that's happening at the same time inside your man, your mind. Man's minds are divided with plans. Sure is. However, he says inside the text, man plans in his heart. Man plans in his heart. It's not, not the pump, but the heart here. And this part we identified already has actually four parts to the spiritual heart. It's got the conscience, intellect, emotion, and the will. The Bible talks about your heart. Your heart, first of all, consists of your conscience. Your conscience decides whether it means what's right or what was wrong. If you've got an evil conscience, then your thoughts, your actions, and your will, emotions are all going to be evil. If you've got a spiritual minded conscience, then the, the way you think, the way you act, the way you feel will be connected to that. The dilemma is that, that you can't allow yourself to be guided by the wrong parts of your heart. You can't trust how you feel. And when your emotions are guiding you, you're always going to be in trouble. you got to watch how you feel. Your emotions are not given to you for making decisions. They're given to you that you might feel good about the right decisions that you make. You can't trust how you feel. I see people laughing and crying at the same time. Are you laughing or are you crying? I'm doing both. Are you happy or sad? I'm both. You can't trust the emotional part of your heart. You can't trust how you think. God doesn't even function. So here's the end of the book. Our underdog, you've got to understand it. Your heart is connected often to your understanding, and your understanding is based on your experience and your education. So, so your understanding is messed up because you were taught wrong. You parent based on what you caught. So what if you were taught wrong? You do wrong thinking you're wrong is right. Paul said, I persecuted the church with a good conscience. I killed Christians and I felt good about it. No conscience can validate a bad idea. It has not been conditioned and trained by God. So, so understand the dilemma. So Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the heart, that's your heart, my heart, is deceitfully above all things and beyond cure. Your heart is wicked. King James says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The writer goes on to say, who can understand it? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search out the heart. I examine your mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. God said, you don't even know your own heart. Don't walk around and say, I got to get up. I'm going to You don't know if you're good or bad. Stop lying to yourself. Ask somebody. They'll tell you. Yeah, the workshop that I do, I'm sure I've shared it before, that I, and I'll actually begin by asking people, how do you know if you are a good employer? You ask your employee. How do you know if you're a good employee? You ask your employer. How do I know if you're a good friend? You have to ask your friends. How do I know if you are a good, a good sibling? You have to ask your siblings. How do I know if you are a good, a good, uh, a, a good ch- a parent, a, a good child? Or a, we have to ask your parents. How do you know if you're a good child? We got to ask uh, a good, a good, a pe- good. How do we know if you're a good child? We ask your parent. How do we know if you're a good parent? We have to ask your child. When your child gets old enough to know what a parent is, how do I know if you're a good mate? I know. I can tell you I'm a good mate. No, 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 no. You won't lie. I know I'm a good one. 
I'm the best anybody can ever have. I am the best mate. You can, I'm the best friend. I'm the best mate. I'm the best employee. I'm the best sibling. I'm the best parent. I'm the best child. Just ask me. Don't ask them. Ask me. That's a clear sign you don't know. The fact of the matter is that although you're more than the relationships inside of your life, they do tell about you. We are not honest, we are not honest perceptors of ourselves. And sometimes, sometimes, that was when I preached in North Carolina as a brother, Calvin, Calvin would say, he said, every year I ask my wife, honey, how can I be a better husband? That's, that's good, man. Well, she, she, she can give an answer, she can answer. The problem is this, that there are a lot of guys not going to ask that question. They don't want me to ask you. So when I ask you a question, it obligates me to try to live with what you say. But the point is the idea that most of us don't want to ask someone, how can I be a better member? How can I be more faithful? How can, how can God use me more? To ask the question suggests the idea there's an openness of change that I want to receive in the context of my life. So, so he uh, said oh, our many, our many parts. We talked about the many parts. He said, our many plans that we have together. He the many different plans. We devise plans. You plan your vacation. We devise plans. Secondarily, we identify. We assume, like we childishly know something. I assume all kind of. I assume the weather is going to be, gonna be better. I assume I can make this trip. I assume my my health will hold. We're always childishly. Assuming things that you just don't know. I, I told the church at 7 30 this morning that uh, I know the year was doing a meeting in, 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 uh, in, uh, in down in the southern Sicily area, uh, in, in southern Italy, and we flew into, into Rome. And so we're flying into Rome. I looked at the map and I said, okay, I said, the, the, the train stops here. The hotel is on La Septembre, a few blocks away. So I didn't, I didn't tell Laura my plan because, you know, sometimes we don't want to be planning. So I just said, I got this. It's all worked out. So we got off the, we got off the, I said, it's right down the street. I know where it is. We got off the, off the tram, had the luggage, pulled the luggage to the corner. I said, wait, wait, right here. I'll be a few minutes. It's just right up the block. <laughs> so I walk up the block. I said, you know, this La Septembre, La, La Septembre. They said, ah, oh, ah, oh, where was La Septembre? La Septembre, where's La Septembre? They just said, ah, oh, La Septembre. I'm all over, I can't find La Septembre the street hotel. I know what it looks like, I saw it online. But La Septembre, I can't, I'm up and down the street because I, I had, I didn't know I was lost. I had a plan. <laughs> but childishly, I thought I knew what I did not know. <laughs> the third, the third, we again, we meditate, we get fixated on things. Our mind is divided forth and we hold the gifts. We can't see and let go of things. We get stuck. I just can't see. I can't let it go. I can't let it go. I can't. You got to practice letting things go inside the life. Number five, we said, you invent God's given us creativity. We can invent things. We can move things. Because of that, that's inside of us. He expects us to reach inside and pull out the creativity either inside of us. And last but not least, we identify we account, we try to figure it all out, try to cap our minds are consistently divided. And so, and so here was Solomon Jones. Uh, understand these ideas of the To be happy, you must let go of what's gone. Be grateful for what remains and look forward to what's coming next. Mm. Amen. Maybe, maybe mm. you need to accept your own limitations mm -hmm. that you can't figure out what's going on. Next of all, consider this idea. God is calling you. God is equipping you. God is preparing you according to His purpose. If you live your life like you have no conscious idea of what to do, you would
Stand in faith even when you're having the hardest time of your life. Stand in your faith. Know that I may not be able to figure out what God's <coughs> doing yet. And to be honest with you, if you had any idea what God was trying to do, you'd mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> you act your best when you discover what God's trying to do. So here what he says. Many are the plan in a person's heart. Many plans. I've got six different ideas I'm working on coming out of my own heart. But it's the Lord's one single solitary purpose. Well. The Hebrew word purpose, it really means counsel. God counsel. He's got, God's got one counsel. God has one counsel. God has one plan. His plan prevails. His plan, the word, the word here, prevails, is a, is a Hebrew word for the stand up. God's plan stands up. And when God's plan stands up, can you not knock it down? When God's got a plan for you, God's got advice for you, God's got direction for you, it don't matter who like you, it don't matter who's on your side, who don't matter who betting on you, who don't matter who love you, it don't matter who can't, who don't stand, who stands against you, it don't matter what plan somebody else has, when God has decided a purpose and you fit inside the purpose that he's got, nobody can knock that down, nobody can change it, you gotta realize the power that God has to make his plan come to life. But every child of God is supposed to live their life on the presumption that God is working right now in my life. I'm not making decisions for my own self. He's got a plan for me. And it's amazing how sometimes folk get upset because God will do your bidding. I told the Lord, you know, you don't do this for me. I'm just cutting him off. Like, like what? Who? You going to cut God off? Really? I ain't going to worship him unless he do it. So he got to, he going to bend to you. And they have the audacity sometimes to be angry at God and frustrated because we talk like somehow he belongs to me. Right. Yeah. I own him. I told him to do this and he ain't going to do this for me. I'm not going to. Like, what you going to do? You going to cut? What if he said it's going to find Nothing to do with me. I take that as mine. Give me the oxygen back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you don't open up for me. <laughs> I can't really hard to take that out. Let me see you do it without my lungs. What do you have that you want to do? This plan works. The key is to see the final plan of God has and drop your plan. Only God's plan. Only God's plan is going to stand. Man makes many plans. God has one counsel. He might. He doesn't have to change his plan because you don't get it. Yo, I don't know about you. Have y'all had kids that got mad at you? Was gonna walk away, leave home. <laughs> I, I, I was five years old. I, 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 I was mad at my mother. She did somebody like. I was five years old. I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> I ain't gotta take this. She said, Well, what you want to go? Leave home. Going to, going to me, you know, that's a sister. Live in Beaumont, Texas, about 10, 15 miles away. You go down there, oh, okay. You know how to get there? I said, you just go down the road this morning, just leave it on. How you gonna find a house? I just asked her, where name you live at? <laughs> well, you take anything with you? And so I took a little lunch, I did an old school checkered, red, black, lunch box, I would call the old metal box, a metal small metal. I got that. I put, I put a pair of shoes in there and a toy. That's all I need, man. I close it up, I walk through the street, and she stood in the door watching me. I got to the street, went down the street, she said, uh, you think I'll just put me? Yeah, I guess I'll shoot you for me. I got distracted, I got to leave. <laughs> In my foolishness, I had no awareness. I didn't even know what I was doing. You think you got that? 
you know, how many choices should you make in your adult life? You looked at later, that was the dumbest decision I've ever made. What in the world was I thinking? You way too far removed from him. <laughs> so consider this. God has a purpose behind every problem. Behind every problem, there's a purpose. Even when God is so good, even when the problem you have is made by you. I thank God, the Lord. I, I, I made a problem. Yeah, I saw that when you did. There's a lesson to be learned from the problem. So I, you know, I'm gonna let you go through it. I got you. I got a plan past your problem. Just don't quit in the problem. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Secondarily, consider that God has a purpose for your pain, a reason for your struggle, and a reward for your faithfulness. You can't give up. I don't see it. It ain't making it. It's hard. Baby, life gets hard. Don't you quit. You can't afford to end your life with a dumb son. I counseled a boy several years ago. I was preaching in Alabama, and I went to visit with him. He had he had, had a conflict with his with his his, uh, his, his stepfather, and he, had, he was angry at his stepfather. He had an argument. He had parked his vehicle behind his stepfather's car, and they had an argument about the car, and it didn't move. And the, and the stepfather was mad, went out there, and shot the window out the car. <laughs> I was talking to the boy. His mother called me, went to the house, said, talk to him the next day. I said, How you think? He said, Well, I I, I, I don't see no choice. Like 19 years old. What do you mean no choice? I ain't got no choice. What do you mean you have no choice? It's either me or him. I'm just letting you know. Now, this boy's father committed suicide. And this boy's mind, suicide is an option. Because understand, whenever you choose suicide, you choose for your family, it's an option. And he says, I'm sorry, I don't know who I'm going to just, I'm going to take him out before he take me out. I said, okay, well, maybe there's some other options. I said, listen, what happens? What happens if you're right? Let's take your, your scenario. Let's say you're successful, you take him out. And now your life is turned upside down. We throw him in prison, lock him inside of a room with two men. Buster and boom. Buster <laughs> <laughs> and boom. <laughs> You stuck the next five or six years living with Buster and Boomer. <laughs> and you get out of there, you can't get no job, can't get no stability, you can't get your life back together because you made one bad choice. I said, there's another option. You can get out. You ain't got to live here. But you can make a choice. I want you to realize how the point of simple idea that don't just quit and give up sometimes God allowed me to turn off to get your attention to move somewhere. I will not cause pain. That's beautiful. Isaiah 6, 6, verse 9. I will not cause pain without allowing something new you're born. Say, the Lord, I'm not going to let you have pain by giving birth to something else. <laughs> Anybody ever had a child again? Oh, yeah. I ain't, you know, never had that. I hear. I've seen there is pain in childbirth. But the pain, what I've seen, the pain in childbirth automatically gives access to another level of something greater. The pain opens the door to an experience of life that's far beyond the pain you went through to get the life. God said, I may allow pain. But the pain I let you go through will give birth to something that's bigger than the pain that you're going through. But you gotta trust him that he knows what he's doing. Well, so there's a plan. There's a plan. The text says God has a plan. His plan is simple. His plan is unchanging. It's free of mistakes. He has all the power needed to make it happen with no disruption. God has a plan. He knows what he's doing. He's gonna work it out. He's going to win. You are not gonna beat the plan. He's got out our, our most serious plans are nothing when it's compared to the plan that God has. I don't care what your plan of retirement is. I don't care what your vacation plan is. It does not matter what's inside your mind. Erase the idea that what you're thinking is so powerful and so mighty and so great, it must happen. It will not happen unless God allows it to happen and it somehow does not go against what he's planning to do. The child of God understands the significance of putting his trust in God. He's not going as quick as planned. 
because it's inconvenient for you. Because you don't like it does not mean God's going to change things. But, but what he will do, what he will do, he will take you and he will leave you what he wants you to be. He will make you the power and the might you need to be. Because sometimes, sometimes it's not about you. It's about God using you to change a world that you'll never see. And I think about my parents and my grandparents and what folks had to go through to get us to a certain place. I look at my children and my grandkids and I ask God, oh, now I can almost get a glimpse of why I went through some stuff to get them where they are now. It was never about me. Whenever you function like it's all about you, you destroy anything God's trying to do. You ruin your own life, your own choice. So God has a purpose. Man prepares, but God speaks the text. And God, man has a plan together, but God says, "Here's what's gonna happen, and it's gonna happen no matter what you think." You can fight God's plan, or you can try to fight God's plan. But what you gonna do? How you gonna fight the wind? Yeah. How you gonna fight the light? Yeah. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. When one is greater and mightier and more powerful than you. Only thing you got a right to do is surrender your will and ask for direction. God's purpose is more important than your plan. He's got a purpose that beats your plan. But I just want to have a nice life and meet some people and have a vacation and work on my job and go home and I don't want to have no stress. God's got a purpose that beats that plan. Why is he letting me go through this? It's bigger than you. got a direction that's bigger than you. And then, of course, his purpose is beyond your plans. I got planned. God said, listen, you only live so many years, baby. <laughs> what I got planned is bigger than you. You're going to be dead and gone. I'm still doing stuff. <laughs> what if God said, I got another thousand years or something to take care of? I need you to do this so that uh, 500 years from now, somebody you never heard about is getting what I'm missing. I'm sitting down the pipeline. <laughs> so it ain't about you. Stay in your lane. And then, of course, God's purpose prevails. It always is going to win. Your hands are just too short to buy some gun. You either decide to be part of the program or get rolled over by it. You can't beat it, might as well join it. And the last but not least, Ephesians 2, verse 10 says this, We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance which God prepared in advance, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All you are are a poetry. You are you are God's sculpture. God looks at you. He decided before you got here, I got a plan for Eric Harris. And when Eric Harris gets there, let's see. I gotta make sure Eric Harris got the right kind of daddy. Cause that, yeah, that that's the man. That's the guy who get Eric Harris ready. And then I gotta make sure you got the right kind of brother. What y'all? And what y'all talk? Get y'all and I'm a brother. I get a brother in his life that's gonna make sure he works with you. I'm gonna work in. Because I got a plan, but he is my sculpture handiwork. He's the plan I've got. And I'm working inside there to achieve something he can't begin to see right now. So, so I'm going to put, okay, I've got to put this woman. What's her name? Lisa. Right? Pull her down. Get in and she don't, he, he need her because he got, he got a rough edge. You know, he's going to get off something. He's going to need some extra teeth. Now, he ain't going to be ready. Now, let's not dump some kids on, baby. Man. He's going to bust him. So they can work with all <laughs> And they're gonna, they're gonna frame him. They're gonna, they're gonna stress him. He gonna wanna kill him. They wanna kill their friends. He's gonna be all right. So I got to go. So I'm sculpting him. He's my, he's my workmanship. He's my handiwork. I'm getting him ready for something he can't begin to plan, see, or anticipate because he's limited. So all he can handle is what he can see. He can't see this. All right. And I'm, I'm shaping him. <coughs> God takes in his brilliance, in his brilliance, God is able to take each and every person in this world, including you. We are God's workmanship, his handiwork, we are his portrait. We are his sculpture work. He sculpted you. 
put you in Indianapolis, Indiana, for such a time as this. And if you trust his plan, if you follow the line with his purpose, you'll walk away saying, thank you, Lord. I wasn't worth it. I wasn't worthy. But thank you that you can look at me and see something <coughs> worth using. But you got to be humble and realize you ain't all in. And it's hard to do. Because we're good faithers. Yeah, we're good faithers. Some of y'all got some pretty cars out there, can't afford to know. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. 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 Oh, it's a pretty car. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, 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 it's just, it just gives people point A to point B. Yeah. Uh, we got two dollars to give. Uh, I can't afford to. They will pick it up next week. I, just, I need to drive home with it at least when you take it up from me. Because we're thinkers. You act like you got stuff you ain't got to impress other people when God is saying, Who are you trying to move? Does it really matter what people think about you? Yeah. Is it not more important what I think about you? Yeah. What I have planned for you to get yeah. It should. It should. And when that controls and dominates your spirit, man's plans are many. God yeah. has one purpose. Yeah. He'll use you. Yeah. Jesus said, I came to serve and bring lost folk to my Father. Yeah. If, if somehow... Your purpose and your plan does not serve to bring people closer to the Lord. You're on the wrong plan. How do you get to be 20, 30, 50, 60, 70, and nobody know the law because of you? It's not in your purpose. It's not in your plan. If your plan is not lining with God's plan, it don't matter what you got, what you do. You be I don't know what you've been facing. I don't know what's been beating on your door. I do know this, that we have a tendency to use all these plans to make things work. And God say, well, none of that work until you surrender your will to me. You're here this morning. Are you ready to surrender? God has brought you this far for the purpose of trying to do something special inside your life. He wants to mold you and give you strength. you here this morning. It's not a part of the family of God. You've heard the word of God. You believe that Jesus, the Son of the living God, you know, change your mind and call that repentance, the decision to stop doing things your way and start doing things God. You will understand what this audience is declaring your confession. He's the Son of the living God. We take you right now and we'll baptize you in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He will add to his family. He will add to his church. He will put you into a place where you can use you for something bigger, better, and greater than yourself. You just come to church. How can God use me to be a better service? Here am I, send me. Give me understanding, give me insight of what you're trying to do for the purpose of God. With that intent, with that heart, with that conscience, God will take you, He will mold you, He will bless you, He will strengthen you, and He will use you. Amen. And all you got to do is stand up and say, I'm here. I, I surrender, I surrender all. I want Him to take over. And you did something bigger, better, greater than myself. Won't you do that? If you raise your hand, I'll walk with you. Somebody next to you walk with you. But you know that right now, you're not walking in the purpose God has. His plan and His purpose is never about you by yourself. It always connects you with His people to achieve great things that give Him glory and give Him honor. And I invite you to come and make the decision even right now as we stand and sing. Why don't you come?